first time speaking for stockcharts.com. So thank you again to uh, Aaron and Tom for having me on. Um, uh, a number of my colleagues I can see have presented on here and presented elaborate technical presentations. I'm going to present something a little bit simpler in format for my first uh, showing here. So um, ignore this glamour shot of me, uh, of my uh, head and let's just make sure we can get these. Okay, so first I have to shamelessly promote my book that I just wrote because I it took me so darn long to write it and I did send uh, Erin a copy and she's halfway through, but um, I just have to shamelessly introduce it um, because it was such a labor of love and work and basically summing up how I managed to be on the wrong side of so many outliers in my trading career. So therefore, anything I present thereafter, you can take with a grain of salt, okay? But the thing is that bad events happen to all of us in the marketplaces because there is that element of risk. And the main challenge and uh, key to surviving is always being able to make back those losses and stay in the game. So there's a lot of stories about that in the book. Okay, onward and tally-ho. Um, I thought I would show some of the market internals that I look at at night. My initial homework for glancing over this probably lasts no more than five minutes. And I do have to, again, shamelessly promote stock charts because I love their sentiment readings and the put call ratios. I get all that data off of there. Um, this is something, a routine that I've done since 1981 and was uh, taught by my first mentor when I was on the trading floors. It doesn't take long, but it's that fact of updating your analysis one day at a time. Um, very important for me. And and so I wanted you to see that it's not overly complicated and just the essence of what I look at. Um, the first thing, this was <clears throat> when I put this together, it just happened to be a fabulous buy signal on the S&P and the market indices. I simply use a nine period RSI and a two period RSI. And you can see the two period RSI just highlights very overbought or oversold conditions. And it's for me, the shape of the curves, that's so important. And honestly, it doesn't matter if you look at a stochastic or a momentum reading, um, have some tool that you rely on consistently. Now, as an aside, when I first started trading on the floor, I'm sure many of you rec um, remember that uh, TV show, Wall Street Week, and um, I remember watching the elves with many other people, the Wall Street elves. And do you realize that for the first 10 years of the elves signal, it had a 92% win rate on its timing signals, 92% over a 10 year period. So after that, I adopted the uh, philosophy of why pay attention to fundamentals and all these elaborate uh, things when it's just a matter of a very simple timing indicator that was based off of, this is what the L signal was based off of, momentum, sentiment, and monetary conditions. So those are my three primary um, variables that I put weight into when uh, making decisions for longer term timing. And then on top of that, I have an element of structure, which I will show you as well. So this here is just simply a momentum type of measurement. And again, I like the stockcharts.com site for the sentiment readings, such as put call ratios and so forth. <clears throat> This is a five and a 10 period simple moving average of New York um, stock exchange breadth. Very simple oscillator and goodness knows there's a million out there variations on a theme. McClellan oscillator has been a wonderful tool for many decades. Um, this is very simple and it just gives me an idea of the overbought, oversold type of readings. And you can see that move up off January actually could be classified as a breadth thrust, another type of um, indicator or signal, if you will, within the context of extremely strong market breadth. So 
as is the case with most momentum indicators, they can indicate both overbought and oversold readings, as well as continuation patterns. So a breadth thrust signal off that lows indicated that we had good upside momentum and therefore continuation. And then you can see the deterioration, sort of the three triple tops, and we corrected that recently and, and hit uh, towards the lower end of the range. So it's a difficult thing for me to quantify in terms of an absolute reading. I think a lot of technical analysis is using our own judgment and experience and our ability to put things into context. So this was just uh, two, three days ago. <clears throat> and then on top of that, I always like to look at the hourly structure and this red, green, red is a way of highlighting that structure. And it's an average true range function I keep on all my charts that was originally put out there by Wells Wilder with his volatility stop and reverse signal. So when price moves down by a certain ATR, it turns the bars red and vice versa. It's not a signal in and of itself, it's just a pattern recognition. And here it's easy to see that we still have that ABC down on the red, green, red structure within the context of that hourly charts. So it's still an uptrend. And I will show you what would actually look like if we were to do a trend reversal. Another thing that I like to look at is the closing tick reading. I use a five period moving average of the closing ticks. And I have used this probably for three decades. And I'll show you something else interesting as well. So at the bottom there, you can see the red line in the middle of the chart that is the five period moving average of the closing ticks. And what you will notice is that the shape of that is nearly identical to a breadth type of oscillator. So therefore, the ticks <clears throat> and the breadth readings are very highly correlated. Um, and uh, just good to keep in mind, I use it again for overbought, oversold within a context looking for oversold readings in an uptrend. And then again, it also has that element of the breadth thrust. Now those bands you see surrounding the ticks, the blue band at the top and the red band at the bottom is a little bit of a secret of mine for longer term timing. And simply put, the top blue line is a moving average of the tick highs, and the red line is a moving average of the tick lows. And if I had to use just one of those, I would just pick the red bottom line and use it as an oscillator. And here is the secret. When those bands squish together, uh, so that there's a narrow range that starts to indicate a contraction in volatility and therefore a bit of complacency. And you will usually see those bands start to uh, narrow near market tops. And then of course, at market bottoms, there's a lot of fear and extreme readings in the ticks, both to the upside and the downside. And when those bands get very far apart, that to me represents an intermediate term buying opportunity. So you can see it's a visual tool. It's difficult to quantify to the day, but it, it tells you the overall environment. And then you might want to drill down to shorter term triggers to look to initiate um, uh, trades with a better risk reward uh, for your initial entry. Lastly, I do look at the NASDAQ internals as well. And I mention this because the slides I just showed you before were on the NYSE breadth. And I actually like to treat them differently, the NASDAQ breadth as well as the NASDAQ TRIN. Now, many, many years ago, the TRIN was one of my key indicators for intermediate term timing, such as a 10-day overbought or oversold type of reading. 
I've pretty much discarded the NYSE trend because it's too distorted with a couple very large volume stocks. For example, Bank of America really could, could cause some distortions in that trend. However, I still find value in this NASDAQ trend. And you can see that periods where it has spiked up high have been close to buying opportunities right? I don't use it as much for sell signals. I like to look for the buying opportunities. And conversely, you can see the 10-day moving average of the breadth on that chart above it looks, again, very inversely uh, correlated at times and, and other times not. But for overall timing, it's, it's a good tool to help frame out context. Lastly, I do believe in volume, and for me, the volume component comes in on the daily basis. So I like to look at the first 30-minute range of the um, New York Stock Exchange volume. And you might say, well, gosh, that's kind of odd because the majority of shares don't even trade on the New York Stock Exchange like they used to. I believe the figure is something along the lines of 15% of, of the activity tends to be on the NYSE. I may be mistaken, but it's not anywhere what it was 20 years ago. But I still find that it, com it, it confirms the overall environment. And if I see a 30-minute um, first opening bar that's much greater than the previous three days, there's pretty good odds that, we've gonna, that we're going to have a trend day or a day of range expansion or pushing up to a new level. And conversely, if it's a very light reading for the first 30 minutes, again, lower perhaps than the previous couple days, pretty good chance that we're going to just have a rotation day. And interestingly enough, this seems to hold true for the whole tone of the market in, in terms of the financials, the bonds, and the currencies. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have a fabulous trend in something like wheat or the crude oil or um, a commodity market, but it really does set the tone for the trading day. So I want to be much more careful about doing breakout trades if we're in a lighter volume type of environment. And I'll feel very good about pushing or even adding to breakout trades or momentum plays when I see that increase in volume. And again, I just like to see it for the overall NYSE. So pretty simple right there in a nutshell. Um, those are my basic indicators. I like the put call readings as, that I get off the stock charts, and I do look at the sentiment readings on the weekend. And other than that, I try to um, not look at too many other indicators because you know the old saying, the best indicator of all is price. And I'm very price oriented. So I mentioned earlier that red, green, red rule for the this, this swings. And I like to use a pure price-based structure, such as the swings up and down, um, to give context, in particular, the daily and the weekly charts. So here you can see the wave structure, and that top left zigzag is in a steady uptrend. Uh, zigzagging up with higher highs and higher lows, and then it makes an ABC down. At that point, for my computer, and I always frame it in terms of what the computer would say, because you know we're so subject to our own cognitive biases, we can easily see what we want to see. So on that top left chart, we're still in an uptrend with an ABC down. And same thing on the far right. I'm sure you've experienced this many times where the market simply makes a liquidation flush and it may take out the previous low. However, it's still in an uptrend according to pure swing trading rules. And we can see in the middle charts there a possible resolution to this, a corrective ABC and then on to make higher highs as well as that liquidation flush down 
and then that still sets up a push for higher highs. So that is one potential outcome from that interesting structure at the top. The second potential outcome is what we would call a pure trend reversal down, where you have lower highs and lower lows. In other words, think of making that ABC down and then taking out that swing low. And you'll see very often it almost will look like a head and shoulders type of topping formation. So those are my rules that I can quantify swings and model them and look at the risk reward um, component to them. So anytime you do see this ABC type of consolidation, it's what I call a quote power buy, or it can then lead to a total failure. And these are some of the structural points that lead to bigger wins. And that's what we're all interested in trading the market. It's not just having a win, but I want to see where can I maximize my points made or dollars earned per holding time. And so very often out of this type of structure, we can get a bigger swing up or down. So there's that component there with a basic swing structure. And then I'm very much an oscillator person. I confess um, probably since 1981 when I began updating these security market research charts by hand, it was based off the oscillator that I'm going to show you. <clears throat> that is the blue line in the middle of the chart there. It's the difference between a three and a 10 period simple moving average, and it has a 16 period moving average of that. And you can see, I always like to have two time frames concurrently here, a weekly and a daily when I'm doing my ch stock chart analysis. So what I did is I categorized about nine basic combinations of weekly and daily chart formations that tend to lead to these bigger wins. And how do we quantify what a bigger win is? Of course, it's always nice when you see that expansion in range and a large standard deviation move. But what I like to look at is something called persistency of trend. And on that far right chart, on the bottom in those squares, you'll see a histogram. That histogram is simply the difference between a five and one period simple moving average. So those boxes show cases where the price stayed above a five period simple moving average for more than seven bars. And that's my whole game is trying to find those spots from a structural standpoint where I can capture possibly a bigger win like that and then see what the market gives you in terms of price movement. So in this particular case on Home Depot on the weekly chart, you can see there was a classic bull flag consolidation on the weekly chart. Um, in that book that I wrote many, many years ago, we jokingly called this the holy grail trade because the ADX rose above 30 and then we consolidated to that moving average. And then on the far right, you'll see a much more complex chart formation. But what I want you to notice is the pattern in the swings that ABC down on that red, green, red rule where we have that power by type of structure. It often can be a little um, bear trap if it's to the upside or vice versa, a bull trap. And so that structure, that power by, that ABC within the context of this powerful weekly chart formation led to the first extended run, <clears throat> that big move up. And then you can see as well, we had another pullback and remember what I said, how powerful it is if the market takes out the high of an ABC type of correction. So that second arrow that I have to the right, okay, was the high that we then took out and that led to that really major move to the upside. So this is how I like to concentrate my energies on just looking at the pure swings 
the pure momentum readings and the pure price structures. My idea of a perfect trade would be where I can have the slope of that 310 oscillator, the slope of the fast line and the slow line turning up in my favor. I, I, I love that opportunity to get that positive slope turning up. And then I call that the wind behind my back. So that's what I want to find. And then as a trigger, because I just showed you quite a lot of complicated um, structures there, but a very simple tool for a breakout or one of the structures that leads to this extended run is simply the two period rate of change makes new 30 bar highs. And you've also got the gap there, which is another wonderful tool. And it's in the context of this weekly uh, potential very bullish chart formation. So at the far left, you can see we actually made new lows in the two period rate of change. I, but I would not put any credence in that because the structure on the daily and the weekly chart uh, was not supportive of a downside move. So I'm not using this as a, an indicator in and of itself. I'm using it as a trigger or a confirmation. Aha, you say, so you know all the tricks. Well, what about where we are now? And by the way, I can show you um, structures that were bearish at the same time that we have buy signals, um, we can have sell signals. I believe there was an excellent one on uh, U.S. Steel to the downside. At the same time, many stocks were making uh, upside moves. So it is independent of that overall timing that I just showed you with the indicators. But of course, that is very helpful in and of itself. So hey, I just happened to come across this today. I'll just show you one, and then I know they're going to kick me off. Well, um, hey, Linda, was, we, actually was, have, we actually have a, couple, yes. we have a couple of questions, if I could just interrupt you for a minute. Oh, absolutely. Please. Um, okay, the first one, and you've gone through a lot of these charts, and I know a lot of viewers are looking at them wondering how they can set these charts up for themselves. Do you have, by chance, a how-to um, in your book on how you set these charts up? I don't because for two reasons. First of all, the book is not a pure technical manual. It's much more um, wisdom and, and process and, and my philosophy. And there are some technical things in there as well. Another factor is that every charting software is different. Um, but this is a very simple example. So um, if anybody is wondering how to create that 310 uh, moving average oscillator, you can simply go to my website, lindarashke.net, and drop me a line, and I'm happy to email you back as, as well as giving you a chart example. Um, the two-period rate of change is pretty self-explanatory. You can use momentum or rate of change on a software platform. And the oscillator is a difference between a one and five period moving average at the bottom. And I simply set it up as a histogram. So it's really easy to see how many days we have on one side of that five SMA, which by the way is plotted with that blue line on the candlestick chart. So it's just a little crutch, a little tool, so that you don't have to go counting the bars on, uh, <clears throat> on the actual chart. But, but please feel free to, to email me, lindarashke.net, um, off of my website, because I sit here at lunch and I eat my can of tuna fish and I don't leave, and that's when I answer emails. So happy to do that for you. Let me just show you one last example here that was setting up today. And the reason this was so interesting was because this chart was very similar to that BR that Erin was showing you earlier, which she said this is showing up as, as something interesting or unusual. And what I wanted to show you here with NVIDIA is we have not only an interesting daily chart formation with a push right to the start of a gap area, always of interest. And you can see that on the far right of the chart, that slow and fast line are just poised to turn up. <clears throat> but also on the weekly chart, 
you have a positive slope to the oscillator there, and there is potential for that fast line on the weekly chart to also turn up. So you've got huge risk reward here in terms of the potential. Now let's go down and see if we had a trigger. And you can see right where I have those arrows that two days ago, that actually was a new 30 bar high on that two period rate of change. So definitely a, a confirmation that you have the upside momentum to perhaps carry us away. It's, it's not necessarily that it's making a new high, it's the new momentum that is important. And um, I would say that this is a methodology that can yield uh, a very high percentage of, uh, of wins for your trades and, and a very high percentage of trades that catch on fire and give you that extended run on one side of the five SMA or simple moving average. And that's what this game is about. If we make 100 trades, we want uh, a certain number of them, of course, to catch on fire and get legs, as we say. And we hey. know, of course, many can fail. Hey, Linda. Yes. Um, on this chart here of NVIDIA, so if, if you like this chart, let's say that, you know, based on what you're looking at here, um, it's giving you a buy signal and you jump in. At what point, using these uh, indicators that you have on the screen, at what point, if it reverses, would you say, hey, this one simply didn't work? Is it the price breakout that doesn't hold? Is it one of those uh, averages that you're looking at turning down? What, what would get you out of a trade if it wasn't working? Price breakouts are um, a tricky stop area because so many times in classical technical analysis, you can have a breakout from a chart formation, but then it will still come down and retest the area of the breakout and perhaps even just poke below it just a little bit. So I don't find that necessarily to be a useful stop. A much better stop is to put a stop in at the low of the range expansion bar. So you can see where I have that arrow drawn, okay, if you were able to get in either on, on that bar or on the close or the next day, I would keep my risk point at the stop of that of, of, of that big bar up because that's where you really had that supply demand shift. And, and so we want to, once you have that supply demand imbalance there and that shift, then I, I try to put the stop underneath that bar. And uh, in this particular case, it was nice because uh, we hadn't yet taken out the high, but the momentum made new highs. So that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. There are a couple more questions here. Can I give those to you? Of course. Um, one, earlier you were talking about volume. I think it may have been when you were talking about volume early in the day. Uh, but the question that came in said, could you please explain what, what you were looking at on your volume chart? That's simply a 30-minute chart of the NYSE volume. And if you were to, in your software programs, put in the symbol, for the NYSE volume and make it 30 minute, you will see it displayed like that, showing the successive bars or increase or decrease in volume for the day. And then it's really easy to compare um, this period to previous periods during the week. And naturally, if it's the day before an FOMC meeting, you'll probably see lighter volume. Fridays, unless it's an option expiration, uh, tend to have slightly lighter volume. So I also will compare Mondays to Mondays. Um, it's a really powerful thing if you see excellent volume on a Monday. Um, that's that's a, a really nice indicator. Whoops. Okay. Uh, another question. If you were a fairly risk averse trader who was un unable to watch the market through the trading house, on which of your signals would you most rely? Well, um, if you want a trigger, I, I mean, gaps and, you know, anything that indicates an increase in, in momentum is always a fine trigger. And of course, it, if you're not watching the market during the day, you probably are of a much longer holding period. So you would not want to use as much leverage as, say, for example, somebody that was um, trading intraday, you would want to lower your leverage. And, uh, you know, you always have tools available to you like options 
or call spreads um, or, or put spreads. Those allow you to take advantage of a technical condition without the stress of, of having too much risk. Um, so those are some options. There's yeah. not necessarily one um, indicator per se. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. New highs, um, you're entering in later for the um, trade-off of a little bit more confirmation, but then your risk point can be a little bit greater. Uh, momentum, you can enter in earlier, but then you might have an increase in noise level as well. Awesome. Uh, another question that came in, and this person must have been thinking on the same lines I was because I had a similar question for you. Uh, does or Do you incorporate Fibonacci or Elliott Wave into your analysis? And I would add uh, Wyckoff as well. No, I don't include Fibonacci at all. Um, there's nothing statistically significant about it in my book. And same thing, I have a problem with Elliott Wave um, because, you know, you can have some real experts out there in Elliott Wave, and they'll still come up with, with different uh, counts and so forth. So too many times, uh, for me at least, a methodology like that allows me to see what I want to see, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, I, I just, uh, I have to eliminate that, you know, seeing what I want to see. Um, and the Fibonacci, you know, it's like you throw enough lines up there, it's bound to hit. Uh, one of them, in my opinion. But there is some value in having uh, something like that. It could be a moving average or a Fibonacci number, or I prefer swing highs and swing lows. And the reason is because they are the most visible chart points. Everybody in the marketplace sees a swing high or a swing low. And the value in having some pivot, if it's a trader's pivot or a Fib number or something like that, the main value is that it's really important to have a reference point by which to gauge the current price action. In other words, is the price moving closer to your level or further away? And how fast is it doing? So if you like to use Fibonacci numbers, it can be a very useful tool in helping you judge the tape action because it's all about relationships in the market. And so you need two data points to express a relationship. Is it moving closer and how fast and vice versa? All right, one final question. This is for me. Um, how important to you is it to you to use a relative strength in your analysis? Like if you're looking at an NVIDIA, is it important to you what's going on with semiconductors relative to the overall market? Or is this simply an independent look at, a, at an individual stock? I think relative strength is one of the most valuable tools out there in, uh, in stock work. And here's my secret to using relative strength. It's very dependent upon your look back period. In other words, if I look at relative strength for the past five days versus relative strength for the past six months, et cetera, I'm going to end up with entirely separate universes. So what I like to do is I like to look at the relative strength, at least to the upside, off of cycle lows or any, anything that's a significant swing low, such as we had just a couple days ago. And then I want to look, maybe I'll use a four-day look-back period and see which markets are giving me the best relative strength up off of that low. That's one way of doing it. And the second way of doing it is, let's say that swing low made a lower low. Which stocks out there actually made higher lows on that pullback? And a great case of this was back in uh, the beginning of the year when we made that significant bottom down there. There were actually a number of stocks that were still making higher lows on the daily chart at that point, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. So um, those are two ways that I like to use relative strength. Excellent points. All right, I lied. One more question. <laughs> no problem. Are we, are we in a bear market or is that beyond, behind us? I don't know how you can call it a bear market. Um, you know, there's I, I've seen quite a number of stocks making new highs. And if you looked at the context of that uh, weekly chart, it was indeed a very, very deep flush. But the structure, overall structure, was still on the weekly charts 
a, a downswing in an overall uptrend. I don't yet have that pattern of lower highs on that weekly chart. So um, my monetary conditions have been green light go. We had excellent momentum off the bottom green light go. And the sentiment readings hit um, some near historic extremes at that low. So green light go. So I try not to um, put myself in a box using uh, expressions like bull market or bear market. I know there's a lot of um, variance among technicians as to what actually qualifies or quantifies rather a bull market or a bear market. And um, I, I just don't consider uh, myself to be on that long of a time frame where I, it's going to be pertinent to me. Okay, fair enough. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on here. I mean, that was a, a tremendous uh, presentation. Um, I don't know if you can bring the slide back up for your book. Um, but I definitely think oh, that I'd uh, be happy to. Well, you know, the fun thing is, if you go to my website, lindarashke.net, you can go and read the first chapter of the book. And uh, if it makes you laugh and, and you get a good chuckle out of it, uh, that's half the, the point. Uh, and the second half is that hopefully I've, I've been able to pass on uh, much of the things that I've learned over 39 years. And I, I do mention a number of technicians that had influence on me or that shared their secrets with me um, throughout the, uh, the book as well, as, as well as traders. Um, you know, Ned Davis, Dick Arms, just some wonderful giants out there. Mike Epstein was, was my hero in many regards, as well as tales from uh, the past that sort of has been a dying culture. We don't have that same wealth and richness and culture of, of this uh, uh, prevailing environment that we had in the 80s and 90s. I mean, everything's very electronic now and broadband and it's a different type of game in one regards. But the beautiful thing is that the technicals really never change. The market's going up or it's going down or it's going sideways. And then there's plenty of opportunity for everybody. Sounds good. I can say this, that uh, what you do and what you've done with your book kind of fits almost like a glove with what we do here at Market Watchers Live, trying to share a lot of our experiences to try to help others make um, or hopefully not make some of the same mistakes we made uh, coming up through because that is uh, it's always good to share our lessons because I think uh, you probably would agree with me we've all paid our tuition in uh, stock market learning. Well I love your program the things that you were presenting it looks like you always present new fresh ideas and that's what makes it fun is is uh, sharing amongst ourselves interesting little tidbits or tricks or or new stocks to look at so thank you as well. Yep. Thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it, uh, pre appreciate it, and we'd love to have you back if you have some time in the future. Absolutely. Excellent. All right. Excellent presentation. Very, very good.